Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by CashFly at CashFly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 15, for Wednesday, April 4th, 2007. The Supernet. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place in, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. Blonde hair and green eyes. Yeah. Hairy wings or, or unhairy wings. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're 70% yeast and 30%. <laughs> that's that how we pretty, enjoy beer. Yeah, well, I, I think we have a real affinity there. <laughs> was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long is your immunity extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close, so are, we, think, how close are we to actually having a, a therapy of some kind? Well, one never knows until one has it. But uh, I would say uh, ballpark 10 years. In many senses, we are unlocking mysteries that go very deep to how the human biology works from this is potentially one of the things that will end up rocking the world the same way that uh, people said oh the sun's the center of the universe oh this and that and everything and now here's somebody who can come out and say hey look here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative our guest today is dr larry smarr he's the director of the california institute for telecommunications and information technology which they call Cal IT2. Dr. Smar has made enormous contributions to both supercomputing and the internet as we know it today. And as you'll find out, he could have just as comfortably been a guest on any of the other Twit Netcasts, including Windows or MacBreak Weekly, The Tech Guy, Floss Weekly, or even the Pixel Core Netcast This Week in Media. Dr. Ed DeLong from Episode 9 suggested that he'd be an excellent guest for FIB for his contributions to the cyber infrastructure that is enabling the emerging field of metagenomics. Well, Leo joins us, and the discussion goes far beyond metagenomics and biotech. So here's the interview. So we're very grateful to you uh, for spending some time with us. That's great. Well, I'm happy to do it. I'm honored to be talking to the man who uh, is responsible for so much. Your team wrote Telnet, I hear? <clears throat> yes. Wow. NCSA Tel- well, it was NCSA Telnet. So Telnet itself, of course, was there from the beginning. But when the uh, <clears throat> Internet transferred from the ARPANET, uh, by the NSF setting up the NSF net, uh, this began to connect the universities in a broad way. And uh, at the same time, the PC and the Mac were just a few years old, and there wasn't any good way for them to get onto the Internet. And so NCSA, which I had founded in 1985 and directed for 15 years, developed the software to do NCSA Telnet, and that's the way most people got on the Internet. Uh, in sort of the 85 to 90 time frame. I remember it. And then using tricks to turn a a text account into a slip account and all sorts of things and using Mosaic. uh... Well, Mosaic is actually an interesting story. You know, um, because NCSA had always been involved in graphics, we did then NCSA Image, um, which uh, later um, uh, was uh, commercialized for the Mac. Um, and then in 1990, we did NCSA Collage, which was a synchronous um, collaboration environment, common whiteboards and um, Wow, that's way that ahead stuff. of its time. Yeah, and that was completely cross-platform uh, between the Mac and Windows and Unix. Uh, and we needed a sub-module to pull documents into that collaboration space. Um, and one of our uh, people said, well, Tim Berners-Lee had just developed this thing called... Um, HTTP and HTML, and maybe we could do hyperlinks. Um, and so we got a team together with Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina, and, and they developed that as a module. But very quickly, of course, it took off on its own uh, to form NCSA Mosaic, and then it was licensed to Microsoft to form Internet right. Explorer, and the server went through open source to Apache, and Mark and Jim Clark went off and founded Netscape. Mark's probably too young, but I'll never forget going from <laughs> links to Mosaic and just, I mean, it blew my mind going from a, a text-based browser where you tabbed to links or you arrowed to links to all of a sudden using your mouse and seeing graphics. 
I, I was actually wow, around. I was using a 286. You remember I that? Uh, net using uh, <laughs> Lynx and uh, 286. Let's let's go back to 1985. What was what was uh, why did you find and found uh, NCSA? What was the purpose of it? Well, ten years earlier than that, in 1975, I'd gotten my PhD in uh, physics from the University of Texas at Austin, and what I was doing is um, solving the Einstein's equations of general relativity for the first time uh, in dynamic situations like black holes colliding or. Wow. Um, Neutron stars colliding, things like that. Was that computation uh, heavy, or was? Yeah, it was extremely. <laughs> and yeah. at those in those days, the uh, universities didn't have supercomputers, and so I had to get a top secret nuclear weapons clearance to go and work in the summer as a physicist at Livermore to be able to get access in the United States to supercomputers to do, you know, astrophysics and cosmology. Um, and this seemed a little bit strange. Uh, to me, but everybody told me that was the way it was done in America. Um, and so then in the early uh, 80s, Max Planck Institute uh, for Physics and Astrophysics in Munich got the first cray on the continent of Europe, put it in an open scientific environment. And I knew the people over there. I went over and, and we did a lot of really interesting uh, calculations on accretion onto black holes and, and, and things like that. But what occurred to me is, well, why can't the U.S. do this? And so I, um, short version of the story is I wrote an unsolicited proposal for, I think, $55 million to the National Science Foundation saying we should set up national supercomputer centers and then connect them with the Internet uh, using the ARPANET technology. Uh, Sid Karen, who I'd never met, actually sent one in three or four months later from the West Coast, um, from General Atomics, and out of that came NCSA and the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Um, and then, of course, there were Cornell, Pittsburgh, and um, von Neumann Center, which only lasted for about five years. But the first thing NSF did then was connect up those five centers using um, this 56 kilobits as the superhighway to connect just supercomputers. So you had this NSF net with five sites, each with you know 15 or $20 million dollar supercomputers connected with a 56 kilobit link. And then out of that came the regionals and eventually to the campuses and onto the campuses. And then, you know, there was this great build out of what became the internet. Um, now today, of course, the laptop is much more powerful and has much more memory than those 15 or $20 million Cray computers. Um, and, and people have gone beyond 56 kilobits. I mean, people are really pained to have to only do 56 kilobits anymore. And yet that was the national trunk. So uh, NCSA was designed to really make bring this stuff to the PC then or? Well, so what I did is the reason I set it up is because I didn't, I realized that there were people like me that were scientists in all different fields of chemistry and uh, engineering and biology and astrophysics who whose science could take a, a huge leap forward if they had access to supercomputer. But there, there wasn't any way to do that without altering national policy and creating uh, a whole new breed of, of infrastructure. Um, in fact, within that first five years, some 30,000 faculty and students took advantage wow. and ran something on one of the five supercomputer centers, which then led to the scientific workstation market um, and eventually the Linux cluster right. market. Right. Um, so it was a classic case of the government changing policy to essentially tech transfer from the military sector, a technology, in this case, supercomputing and visualization um, and mass store and that sort of thing into the, um, you know, the open university sector. That's kind of what happened with uh, uh, DARPANET and uh, NSFNET too, isn't it? Exactly. And so this is a kind of an untold, untold story, I think. Um, you know, I mean, it's why you got microwave ovens as they came out of the radar right. project with Lincoln Labs during World War II. They and, noticed they heated up cans of beans when they <laughs> when they put them in the line of the radar. <laughs> so, so you know, there's this America, for better or worse, has this thing of putting tremendous amount of money into the military. I mean, look at CDMA, uh, Qualcomm. That came from um, declassifying a... Um, a particular mode of wireless communication uh, into what became CDMA. Not to get so, political, uh, but I imagine that's because there's a lot of funding for that kind of research on the military side, where there isn't how, so much. It's how America does it. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where did airplanes, commercial airplanes come right, from? Right. You know? Right. So, I mean, over and over and over again. In fact, there was a study that looked at all of the federal science and technology laboratories, um, including the Naval uh, Observatory, you know, uh, all of the, just all across the country. Every one of them was created during a war. Interesting. Now, Mark, that's not quite the case in biotech, is it? I mean, it seems like biotech is a civilian project in many ways. The Genome Project was partly government funded, but... Well, I, I can remember how the uh, when I first started using a browser to access National Center for Biological Information into the, the GenBank database, right? Beforehand, you used to uh, use software that was uh, VAX2, and you'd get onto the VAX2, and they'd be all the genomes would be updated, or genome data would be updated uh, by admin uh, servers, uh, uh, administrators. And we sort of accessed a very small fraction of uh, of what was being done because you know genes were being sequenced every day, and then it got centralized. So accessing uh, uh, through the web uh, really it, it caused genomics to explode. Um, and that's that's what's brought us to today. You know, with the system that the Moore Foundation is funding here at Cal IT two, um, my institute, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology. Um, where we're actually going to be doubling the number of proteins in GenBank uh, with all the new data that comes from Craig Venner's Around the World uh, expedition, uh, picking up seawater every couple hundred miles and sequencing it. We did an interview with um, Ed DeLong, who's a, a, a metagenomics specialist at MIT, and and also with uh, the 454 gang, um, uh, who are sequencing the Neanderthal genome. What's really amazing right now in biotech is that um, instead of sequencing genes one at a time, uh, people are going after whole genomes in a day. And so we're doing millions of parallel experiments where uh, in the 90s and uh, early uh, of this dec- part of this decade, things were done one at a time. So the data was not, was not, of, uh, it was not huge. You could fit on, a, on an iPod. Right. But uh, with this tr- new transition into like, you know, genomics and proteomics, uh, where do you see uh, the framework going? Because I'm like five years behind. So right. your work is sort of establishing a, a, a superstructure, an infrastructure that is, yes. is sort of well ahead of what we're thinking, what I'm thinking about. So could you tell us a little bit about where that's going? Yeah, we call it the camera project. And the C is for community cyber infrastructure. Um, we're really um, building a overlay to the Internet for science that is arguably a hundred to a thousand times more powerful than the internet. Um, and we're using this particular large data set that um, comes from Craig Venter's Around the World uh, uh, voyage, as well as some of Ed DeLong's um, data. Uh, and, and we're going to have more and more people like Ed DeLong contributing data uh, to us. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about uh, the cyber infrastructure. First of all, we built a um, small-scale supercomputer, about 512 processors, um, along with a couple of hundred terabytes. That would be a hundred thousand, <laughs> couple of hundred thousand gigabytes of wow. rotating storage. Uh, the new stuff from Sun Microsystems, uh, the what was codenamed Thumper, Andy Beckelsheim's uh, brainchild. And so then um, we're uh, working with the Venner Institute to uh, put a lot of software tools that the genomicists use, uh, like BLAST and, and other kinds of things that can compare uh, you know, strings of, of uh, pieces of the genome across all of this data. Um, and uh, this allows for this is this complex is about as powerful as the supercomputer center NCSA was when I left back in 2000. But that was for the whole country across all disciplines. Here, it's just for this data set and for this um, rather small component of the biological community that studies uh, metagenomics. Um, Going back to your comment, it's not just that we've gone from genes to full genomes. The first full genome was 1995. But now we're, uh, in Craig's work, uh, looking at up to several thousand species of microbe at a single place in the ocean. And you're sequencing all of their genomes, several thousand species genomes, simultaneously. 
And so you're really beginning to get back to the way life really is on Earth, which is that you have these tight ecologies, sort of think of them as biochemical webs um, that co-evolve as the environment changes and adapt to it. The environmental uh, data as well, all the metadata with respect to where those, uh, you know, on, on a time frame and uh, the, the chemistry of the environment and who's interacting with who. Indeed, we're looking uh, at the NASA yeah. satellite images um, that were of the place in the ocean, you know, on the moment that the data was taken. Um, and we're looking, um, I mean, right now, for instance, uh, people are beginning to look at the uh, hydrothermal vents uh, a couple of kilometers down on the ocean floor. And we have uh, several hours of high-definition video of those two worm colonies that are all built on top of these microbes. So that's all metadata. And, and I'm, I'm very excited about this because I think what it means is we're, you know, reductionism has been very important for a century in science of breaking things apart. You know, I mean, the whole discovery of DNA 50 years ago was um, part of that program. But now what's going on is a kind of synthesis of putting it all back together, not just for single living organisms, but for these tight ecologies of organisms as well. Um. Could, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, your Opta Optiputer project? It, well, this is the first science server built on top of the new technologies we've spent five years developing with the Optiputer project, which is a big NSF-funded research uh, effort that probably a dozen different universities around the world are involved in. I'm the principal investigator of it. But what it really um, looks at is this is the next stage in the Internet for cyber infrastructure. So let's go back to how the Internet works. You know, um, the fiber optics that form the backplane of the Internet are, 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 you know, some telephone company or carrier has provided them. But what's amazing these days is that you don't just have one stream uh, down of fiber optics. You can have up to 40 or even 100 parallel uh, 10 gigabit, even 40 gigabit per second channels. So think of it as like a super highway with like 40 or 100 lanes, each going at 10 billion bits per second. And so one of those is the backbone for the internet. And then we're all on that. It's, you know, we share the internet the way we used to share a mainframe We uh, when computing was scarce. And so the trouble was when you're on a mainframe, you were always getting in each other's way and you never knew when you were going to get your job back. And it was a very unpredictable environment and often very frustrating. Well, that's the way the Internet is today because we're all sharing it. And even though there's 10,000 megabits, 10 gigabits as a backplane, most individual users only get tens of millions of bits per second. And in fact, if you're at home, you only probably get one or two million bits per second. Well, but there's nothing to stop you from just taking one of those those lanes on the fiber and giving it to an individual. Is that so kind like, of what Verizon's doing with its Fios? I mean, is that the idea? Well, Verizon has said that it, it has a 10-year a, a goal of getting fiber to the home for all of its customers. Wow. Um, and, and once that occurs, uh, certainly fiber to the home is really taking off in a big way in Japan right now. I think they have to 5 to 7 million houses already. Um, once that happens, then then you can begin to imagine a gigabit per second to the home. That's amazing. How about upstream? Would it also was it, is it symmetric? Well, that gets to the details. One of the problems apparently that is slowing this down is to get the lasers cheap enough that you can put on the home to do the upstream um, in a symmetric way with what's coming downstream. So that's why it's going to probably be a while. Uh, but even getting to 100 megabit uh, would be a huge, huge. difference, yeah. right? So anyway, what we've done is we've all around the world now, we have these uh, what we call personal light paths, um, or they sometimes call them lambdas, which is the Greek letter for wavelength because you're a different infrared wavelength on the laser, these parallel tracks we're talking about. So... Um, you know, that means that uh, from your lab, you could come in at, at uh, you know, 10,000 megabits per second instead of 10 megabits a second, so a 1,000 times more bandwidth. But, of course, if you do that, you have to reinvent 
the PC that terminates the internet, right? Because <laughs> you're fast enough. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's like you know. Imagine I start blasting you with a hundred times or a thousand times the bandwidth. <laughs> right. You know, you're, you're going to die on a PC. Well, and, and not only that, but uh, I, mean, I notice even with my broadband connection, sometimes I'm faster than the servers out there. And if, if I can right. imagine my server, this server that this show is on, being hit by a th- hundred thousand gigabit pipes, is not going to be a good thing for me. Right. So what we've done is created something called OptiPortals in the Optiputer project, which are now being deployed, for instance, at Ed DeLong's lab at MIT for this um, marine metagenomics. That is, that's the first scientific discipline that's going to really try out this Optiputer technology. Uh, if it works, of course, we can use it in any science discipline. Um, but but these OptiPortals are taking your standard uh, PC um, display device, the LCDs, and then tiling them. Uh, for instance, our biggest one is up, t- um, you know, those wonderful 30-inch uh, Apple cinema displays? I'm sitting in front of one right now. Well, we got 50 of them. Oh, man. And, <laughs> I want one. There's a picture and, on your website of, of, of this, yeah. by the way, if people want to see. Yeah. Well, Apple actually ran it on their news site as well. Uh, but then there, uh, each of those, of course, has its own PC. So it's it's really a, a visualization cluster right. disguised as a display wall. Unbelievable. And so that gives you, um, in that case, 200 million pixels uh, worth of viewing space as opposed to the megapixel you have on a regular PC or the four megapixels you have on your um, Apple 30-inch. Um, mm-hmm. And that's because, you know, if you're dealing with something like biocomplexity, you, you can't just keep going from a gene to a genome to a thousand simultaneous genomes and expect it to fit on the same million pixels you got on your PC screen. Uh, something's got to give. And, and, and for some bizarre reason, you know, Moore's law has, has made your computer that you're sitting on right now um, a you know, call it a, a thousand times faster than yeah. it was ten years ago. Yeah. It probably got ten thousand times as much storage. Yeah, you got about twice as many pixels. Hey, that's not wow. right, man. <laughs> so that's what I we're changing. More. <laughs> that's what we're so, changing. That's this would be streaming, streaming too, right? You'd be able to take this information and stream it, and or super super HD streaming. Yeah. So what we're doing now is then once you have that, once you have a pipe that's like one or 10 gigabits a second and you're the only one on it, then even though we keep the internet protocol, we don't, we can lose TCP because that was the transport protocol. It was designed for a congested network. And we use variants of things called UDP, things that are made for large scale um, streams. And we have something called Lambda Stream that takes high definition video um, and just streams it end to end. And so we're building in we have a windowing system uh, on this uh, tile wall that was developed by the Electronic Visualization Lab at the University of Illinois Chicago. Um, and that windowing system allows you to open a window with a full HD stream coming in. And then we're working the audio and the echo cancellation and so forth. So you can just walk up to the wall, click on, you know, somebody has one of these somewhere else in the world. And then you just start talking to them in HD um, while you're bringing up, say, you know, a 100 million pixel data set and, and both of you are seeing it interacting with it and so forth. So it sort of just like eliminates distance. You must be hating this Skype call right now. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking this is this is so 18th century what we're doing here compared to what you're talking about. Well, it you know, we've gotten in this funny situation, I think, in America where after the bubble crash in 2000, somehow the innovation in the telecom sector went to zero. Um, All of the companies went bankrupt that had been doing all the great optical innovations and so forth. But what we've been doing is sort of, while the market sorts this out, taking the innovation into the university sector Uh. and... Um, we have, for instance, a number of faculty here who were at Lucent, uh, at, uh, you know, in the big optical startups and so forth. And so they are working with us um, along with, uh, you know, like NTT Innovation Labs is still, you know, got a major uh, Bell Labs like type of laboratory in Japan. They work directly with us. We're streaming, for instance, from uh, Japan 
4K digital cinema. So, um, you know, full HD is like 2,000 lines across, and that's not what you see at home on your, right. you know, so-called HD. Um, so, so-called HD. I'm liking this more all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're maybe getting 15 <laughs> right. megabits a second. Right, right, right. Okay. So it comes out of the camera at 1.5 gigabits a second. And can't even be more with these new red cameras and so forth we're talking about. Well, so the red cameras are now 4K, and 4K. that's four, four times HD. So this yep. is the standard that the, the seven stu- uh, Hollywood studios have agreed on to replace film. Wow. And so when you look at this, it's 4,000 lines across, okay, and by 2,000. So 8 megapixels per frame, 24 frames a second, and that's about 6 gigabits per second, 6,000 megabits a second. And and so if you think about it, that's, um, you know, you need a 10 gigabit empty pipe. In fact, if you compress it using JPEG 2000, which is the standard that the industry has decided on, and, and um, we're using encoders and decoders from the MTT Innovation Labs uh, in our experiments, uh, you can get it just down inside of a gigabit pipe, uh, empty gigabit pipe, so 500 megabits a second. So we have a persistent uh, collaboration set up with Keio University in Japan, which is like the Harvard of Japan. They have the lead for digital cinema in Japan and Cal IT2 here in San Diego. And so we can literally do telepresence um, interactions between KO and Cal IT2 at, wow. uh, over this uh, 4K video. Um, so, so it is I'm, I'm super definitely going to have to wait to get that new TV. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about it is this will all be in your home, I'm convinced. In well, that's, inside yeah, of a decade. Just, really? In the next 10 years? Can you give us a picture of some of the applications you see? Uh, people using it for, I mean, in science as well as uh, in the home. I mean, right. Well, I mean, let's just start with the home. What you, let's just get with what, how you want the world to be, how the way way you want the world to be is that you're in your living room and, um, you know, little Joseph is just having his second birthday. And so you've got a little family birthday thing going, but Aunt Mabel, she's in Syracuse and Uncle Henry, you know, he's off in San Francisco and, you know, you're sitting in Atlanta. Um, and so what you want to do is just have the walls be electroactive and they just dissolve. And then the wall in Aunt Mabel's house and your wall are the same wall. Wow. And, the, and the other wall is in Uncle Henry's house and then they're the same wall. And so their rooms and your room, the wall just disappears like it's a giant window. It's the holodeck. And then yeah. <laughs> Well, but when you want that, holy, yes, I want it right. I can't. What I'm amazed at is the notion that this could happen in a decade. Uh, uh, that that's just mind blowing. Well, I mean, look, Verizon, you already said, is going to be putting a gigabit to the home. Now, there's a lot of technical details and the lasers and everything else. And can they really get it up to a gigabit symmetric and so on? But if it's not 10 years, it's 15 years. It's not 20 years. Um, and and so then you got the pipe. Um, and you know, um, Sharp just announced the 108 inch LCD, uh, yeah, we recently. Just, we just, I just showed it on Regis and Kelly. It's a, it's beautiful. It's amazing to yeah. see. Yeah. Well, and but it's only, Sharp, but it's only the smaller resolution, you know, the, the 2000 but, resolution that you're talking about. But, but Sharp in October showed their first 4k ah. LCD. And so you can imagine, um, Probably this year, uh, there's going to be a 4K display. That's uh, there's a prototype is 64 inches. So so, t- so telepresence to go presence from that to is, a wall is yeah. you know not, not a, a big, big deal. deal. Yeah, telepresence is one obvious application. Does it change how we compute? Well, I think the big problem right now is in the United States is that is that supercomputing is going down a path independent of these optical network developments. And that's why I decided to get out of running a supercomputer center and build this super network instead, because it's got to be in balance. So, you know, we're talking about going from teraflop machines to petaflop machines, a thousand teraflops. Um, Well, a teraflop machine is enough to do, say, a, a 
a drug design or a cosmology or something of a thousand by a thousand by a thousand spatial volume. That's a billion zones with your variables in it. A petaflop machine is going to do something vastly beyond that. So how can you possibly interact with that except visually? Yeah. You know, basically, in other words, the petaflop is a is able to solve the laws of science to be able to create an artificially real environment, whether it's, you know, drugs interacting or inside of a thunderstorm or, um, you know, uh, you know protein incredible, fold model. Yeah, yeah, incredibly detailed uh, new jet transport or whatever. It's so real. It's as real as the real yeah. thing, right? So, so, so you got to start dealing with virtual stuff the way you deal with reality. You don't print out reality. You don't put it out on a bunch of numbers and go look at it later. You know, you just interact with reality as it comes second to second with your, you know, full set of five senses. And that's what we've got to do with the virtual reality because it's it's become as detailed and its specific characteristics as reality has. How about inputs? Uh, obviously, the keyboard and mouse are not going to work. They're a hundred year old technology already. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> yeah. Think about the keyboard. I mean, yeah. that's the that's a typewriter, right? Right. I mean, whose idea was it that we needed a hundred year old technology as the interface to cyberspace? Like what you know, next? something's wrong with that picture, <laughs> right? So what so, do you uh, imagine, though? I mean, we, uh, we, we've all said that, but, but it's hard to come up with a replacement. The, the, um, um, you know, we've been doing virtual realities for, with the Electronic Visualization Lab for over a decade, and we're building a, a, a new one here at Cal IT2. And these virtual reality rooms are like the living room I mentioned. The big walls just sort of disappear and and um you're in this cosmology or in this you know um the protein environment or whatever and it looks just as real as reality and you walk through it and it moves it tracks your head so it knows where you are um and you know it's taken longer for this to to really take off than you'd expect all of the gaming stuff may be a driver we hadn't right. anticipated right yeah, because people want their games to be real for sure. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, entertainment is in many ways a driver for all of this, I would say. Well, it is, and it's going to become that more and more, I think. I mean, we're seeing, oddly enough, the first um, usage of these uh, gigabit, 10 gigabit pipes is not coming from the astronomers or the you know people you normally expect, except for the particle physicists. They're certainly using it because they've got to hook everybody in the world over to the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva that goes on this year. That's right. So they've been the driver of it. But it's digital cinema. Right. You know, it's the studios. And it's all over the world. We've got people from Canada, Japan, uh, Italy, uh, all over that are becoming part of this digital cinema initiative we call Cinegrid here at Cal IT2. I think we're also talking about uh, computers that are, as you said, are much smarter and Maybe maybe this is something that you, you'd like to not talk about because I think it could scare people, but Ray Kurzweil sure, sure talks about the singularity and so forth. Are, yeah. are we imagining computers that are that we can interact with as, as if they're human? Well, I think think of smart pets. Uh, that's first. a little less that's a little less challenging. <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. you know uh, people talk to their pets. Right, they don't maybe understand us too well, but we we try. So, having a computer intelligence that can talk to you, that can interact with you as much as say a dog or a cat, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, and now imagine though that it's portable. I mean, you know what what you'd like to do when you walk into your next social networking event, you know is have a kind of a heads up display or somebody that whispers in your ears saying, well, the person that's walking towards you is such and such. And, you know, um, he just switched positions from this company, to that company. Love and it. you last had communication with them, you know, six months ago. Remember you said this and this. Oh man. His and wife's name is Julie. His kids yeah. are eight and 11. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. 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 And I think that's all going to happen pretty soon. Um, there's nothing that difficult about it. Um, 
So you're you're really envisioning a computer that we will interact with as we do a human, though. I mean, one that we can talk to. We will see this, you know, perfect display. Um, yeah, it'll. We can give it commands. We can ask it to do things. Well, will it talk uh, back to us? Um, only if you program it to. Um, so for instance, there are, you know, we do value people who are friends, but sometimes tell us they're not sure what we're doing is the best course of action. Um, and that could be valuable, right? I'm, I might actually take it better from a computer than from my friends. <laughs> to be well, for instance, with you. I, I have this, uh, I have a navigation uh, system in my car and there's this person, um, a female voice, but by now I think of her as just right. my computer friend. Right. And she tells me, you know, how to get from one place to another, turn right here, coming up and everything. And then occasionally I, for, you know, will decide I don't want to do that. I'll turn the other way. And, you know, she's very patient. She doesn't get mad at me. And, and, and she says, um, well, I'm computing the new route. Um, right. now, uh, you want to go to the right on this next point. Right. So, um, she's very sweet. Yep. That's really, you're right. That may be the wedge into, into uh, our, uh, exp- you know, uh, getting used to this kind of concept. I can't drive it. I can't navigate anymore without yeah, her. I, that's I'm right. lost. Yeah. So I'm, I've, I've developed a codependency with her. <laughs> I'd much rather she gave me directions than my wife. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. We're recording this, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> my wife already knows. <laughs> but honestly, I think, uh, you know, if you really think about it, we're already way down the path of what De- Doug Engelbart talked about as augmentation of the human through digital means. Imagine you're uh, a young aviator in a military jet. Uh, you know, you're still a human, right? But that jet and all the avionics around it, and you're linked back to the entire worldwide system of the military and all its satellites and radars and everything like that. That's an augmentation of you as a human being. And there's mechanical augmentation. This thing is fly by wire, something the human couldn't do. Um, you know, it's, it's, you're in a human augmented situation. Uh, in your car, a modern car has uh, probably a hundred uh, microprocessors, sensors, and actuators, and five different sub networks. Uh, you know, the computers are actually running all the subsystems in your car, and um, so we're we're quite a ways down this path. And in in Japan, uh, it's very interesting culturally. They seem to have much less of a hang-up than Americans do about robots. And so because they have this aging population, I believe they'll probably lead the United States in developing people-friendly uh, robots because they, they don't have the you know, flesh and blood people enough in their uh, country to take care of the people who are aging. Wow. In fact, they are. Honda's already got a walking robot. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but I think that the, they don't have this somehow that maybe they didn't watch the same movies we did or whatever. But <laughs> we have they, this they, fear, they, yeah. We've got Will yeah. Smith, yeah. <laughs> well, where does this fear come from? I mean, you know, it's manufactured by right. Hollywood, Hollywood. Uh, right. and, uh, you know, science fiction books and stuff. But, you know, if you go back to Asimov uh, in the in the 50s, uh, the iRobot right. series, which is a long series of books, um, you know, the robots were were created to, to, you know, to help humans never uh, intentionally harm a human. And um, Do you imagine that uh, Asimov's rules will be, in fact, a part of any robot that's created? Sure, the lawyers will make sure. I mean, they work. I mean, they work. You, 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 don't want a, you don't want a robot doing something to a human and then the person coming back and suing the company that made the robot. Yeah, that's true. So I think they're going to be very conservative. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting uh, vision that you're painting. Now, this is a, a, a biotech podcast, <laughs> and we've gone kind of far afield, Mark. Do you, do you want to no, okay. steer no, us back is... into the uh, biotech world here? And what does this mean for biotech? Well, let well, me come back a little bit to, to the, the, you know, what are people doing with all these genes and genomes? Um, 
you know, there, there's both a lot of medical applications as well as biofuels, which is becoming an increasing sort of out of nowhere biotech um, application. So you, you know, you, you, Craig Venner himself, you know, has now created this new startup called Synthetic Genomics, and its purpose is to take the genes that um, are being discovered and put them into microbes that are more appropriate for a chemical engineering environment to create biofuels, whether it's creating hydrogen, ethanol, whatever. Um, you know, that's where microbes, one of the, I mean, the two big places microbes have been used for a hundred something years is medicine and brewing. <laughs> that's right. For thousands of years for brewing. Right. Yeah. So, but now you're going to have designer microbes that are much more efficient um, than, you know, for instance, uh, digesting cellulose. Um, so you can use um, switchgrass or, you know, the corn stalks instead of the corn to make ethanol, things like that. So I think that's a lot of it. Um, but then, for instance, you know, in the human, there are these um, things called kinases, uh, which are uh, cell signaling proteins that are in uh, about 500 of them in, in the human. And when they go wrong, they can create cancer and all kinds of things. Um, in fact, Gleevec is one of the drugs that was <clears throat> made uh, specifically to block the, the malfunction of, of one of these kinases. Well, in the, these ocean microbes, um, this 500 kinase family of proteins, there are, I don't know, 10 or 15,000 new ones that have been discovered. So far. Yeah. And just starting. And, and all of the indications from Craig's work and his team is that um, the discovery rate of new proteins is still just going straight up. So every time you sample a new biological system, you're going to find new proteins. Well, absolutely. One thing that uh, I, if we move towards uh, sequencing the entire world, basically every living cell, uh, which is now uh, you know technologically feasible and we're sort of on the upscale towards it. Uh, we're going to have the genetic information, but we're also going to need uh, proteomic information because the genes don't necessarily translate straight as proteins. They get modified, and then you have millions of proteins uh, that can form even if you have a 20,000 genome, 20,000 gene genome. or so, And all that data, uh, we need infrastructure for it. Right now, it's it's not possible to, you know to really uh, tackle that kind of information. So I'm, I'm sort of listening here very excitedly at, at the possibility of, of, of some kind of augmented reality where I could go in and, and search for things in, in a whole new way that allow me to uh, Well, let me just give you an example. Yeah. In, in one of our virtual reality systems here, we've uh, taken one of these uh, marine um, thermophiles that live near boiling water called Thermatoga. And... Um, this microbe, uh, uh, thanks to the Joint Center for Structural Genomics that is working with us here at Cal IT2, they've they've now got the folded three-dimensional protein of a good fraction of that of all the proteins in that microbe, and so then in our virtual reality, we just create, if you like, um, you know, uh, imagine you click on on any gene, right? Yeah. And then up comes that folded protein. And now you can go in and start clicking, and the whole protein data bank is back ended to this. And so, in these beautiful colors and full 3D with glasses, you know, stereo glasses and head tracking, um, you can just pull as fast as you can click in, in a 3D mouse sort of thing we've got. That you, just as fast as you can click, you're bringing up proteins, and, and you can dock them, you can rotate them, you can um, uh, lay on top of each other, you know. Oh, it's it's a complete anatomy down to the molecular level. I mean, yeah. it's like a Google Earth down to the uh, near atomic level, which is well. In fact, we're taking that to actually that extreme in what we call our cell-centered database that Mark Ellisman is uh, running out of the School of Medicine here, and and that's really if you think about a a, a cell, uh, that's the great new frontier. That's what's going to I think occupy biology for the next ten or fifteen years, <laughs> because the cell 50. is insanely <laughs> complex in terms of what what goes into it, um, how many thousands of proteins and, you know, uh, zillions of ribosomes and, and mitochondria and um, all of these components. And, and it's not just like a bag of fluid. There's the 
intercellular reticulum that kind of is a scaffolding that that it Absolutely. can be worked for s signaling as well as uh, sites that you, you know these molecules can attach to and do catalytic kind of things. So we're actually bringing geographic information systems into a database in which then as you take these cells and you be and, and anybody any scientist in the world is doing some little sub thing right then that data gets put into where the cell where it where it is in three space and you begin to really literally have this google earth in 3d of the cell well you can imagine as well uh you know not only one cell but a billion cells the entire human anatomy down to that level and then when you cross compare uh you know the various disease markers and and states and if you have access to all of them you could uh you know computationally uh make predictions uh and and, and you know scale up diagnostics yeah, i'm really uh, i'm smiling here and i, I think, no, that's yeah. that's absolutely true and in fact at cal it2 our we have four big application areas but one of them is called digitally enabled genomic medicine um, and that's a, you're assuming there that you've got the uh, within you know probably ten years, essentially all of us will have our full genomes sequenced at least the million or two uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, the mutations that make us different from one another as humans. There are only about a part in a thousand differences between any two humans on the planet in terms of mm -hmm. their DNA. So if it's three billion base pairs long, a part in a thousand means about a million. So you know, one or two million of those, and, you know, that would fit on a thumb drive. So um, now imagine you've got, you know, an anonymized, you know, to protect privacy, anonymized data bank of those variations across, say, the population in the United States. Well, then what you'd see, of course, is that they, because of the family trees, you know, if you sort of go back and figured who, you know, made it with who to make whom, um, there are these kind of subsets of populations of people who have a same genetic set of mutations that make them, say, more susceptible to um, macular degeneration or schizophrenia or sensitivity to penicillin or, or whatever. We'll know all of that. Yeah, um, there's... Yeah, definitely. Like if you look at the 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 genome work that's been done in Iceland, where as an mm -hmm. island, and it gives rise to uh, the well, genetic disease now shows up because you have two copies of the same gene. I mean, there's less genetic diversity on on an island like Iceland, um, right? But this can go beyond you know genomes where you have proteome data where you know yes. you you get a loaded small blood sample, and these technologies are being developed where people can then in a um, clinical setting map out every single protein that's found in your blood and identify proteins that are novel uh, due to disease. And right. um, accessing this information uh, and the interplay of it uh, will, will be extremely powerful. It's going to be it's change medicine. It, and, will uh, give, it will give a scientific basis to medicine. Exactly. I'm, I'm looking forward oh boy. to this. The I, doctors so, are going to love is, that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, everybody is. So this is, well, I really me, appreciate I uh, Dr. Smar's uh, coming on. It's fantastic. Because this let is me, kind of a, it's the future uh, of, of where technology is going. A lot of things. Uh, let me ask just real quickly one final question, which is in the past, it's always kind of been said that uh, the universities and the research labs are about 10 years ahead of you know, what we're going to see in the real world. Is, is you, you said a while ago, a decade, is that about still the time frame or are things speeding up? Well, I'll tell you, um, the thing that I find fascinating is that for so long I've worked in an environment in which I just assumed that the scientists in the universities would do things first uh, when they're still too expensive, like, you know, my first gigaflop right. computer, gigahertz computer was a Cray 2 in 1988 and right. cost $15 million. Right. But I had from 1988 to 2000 to figure out what to do with a gigafly, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and so that's been the great, the way it's all done. And this is sort of, you could call it trickle down or whatever, but it goes from the sort of, you know, elite science down to the mass public on right. a sort of 10 to 15 time, your time scale. Right. But now look at the kids, you know, look at MySpace and, and Facebook and all of these uh, sort of global social networks, Second Life, uh, you know, uh, war, World of Warcraft, uh, th these phenomenal uh, large social network things. There's nothing like that that the scientists are doing. Right. So they now, the popular culture has got out in front of the 
of the elite scientist. And one of the things I'm trying to do is to get enough teenagers Sorry. around here that we can have anybody who knows what the hell is going on so I we can it. bring that stuff back to the scientist and Very get them on. That's setting why up I do their a own social networks. It's cross <laughs> it's cross pollinating is what it really is because uh, yes we'll play World of Warcraft or Second Life but we sure would like to do it on a 4K screen. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you what we'll we'll get together we'll work it out okay. That sounds great. It's been great talking to you and it's fascinating stuff and very exciting and uh, man I just I. Uh, it just gives you a reason to stick around for the 10 or 15 years just, just to see what's going to happen next. And for someone my age, that's very important to uh, have that motivation. Well, I know that's why Ray Kurzweil wants to live forever. I don't, I don't know if I'll make it that far. Well, but. Uh, Dr. Granty's working on it. Yeah, yeah. Ray, that's right. Ray, yeah. Ray is always a little out ahead of me. I, uh, <laughs> He's ahead of all of us, I think. It's great to talk to you, Larry. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So many thanks go to Dr. Larry Smarr for being so generous with his time. And again, he's the director of the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, or Cal IT2. I'd like to thank uh, Philip Peltier and Will Hall for the great opening and closing themes, and to Marcus Volter from Software Engineering Radio at se-radio.net for his help with the audio production. I'd also like to thank Harry Gill for his help with the show notes. And finally, for the disclaimer, the ideas and opinions expressed here do not reflect those of Yale University or the Yale School of Medicine. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Peltier. I think this was this was a, of such great general interest that what I'd like to do, with your permission, Larry, is uh, edit some of it and put it on my radio show as well. Sure. Uh, no, I'll I'd just be happy to. Yeah, I'll just take. I'll just take. That way, you don't have to do another interview. But I'll just take little sound bites out, and it's uh, yeah. it's uh, on XM and it's national, and a lot of, I think people should hear this vision because I think it's fascinating. 